now we see the tear coming around and being blended into the original tear. Posterior capsule is quite a bit thinner than the anterior capsule. Capsule forceps with delicate, sharp teeth are advantageous. Here you see one little tag has to be grasped to complete this tear. If that opening in the posterior capsule was this shape of a tear, one can grasp this edge with forceps after instilling a viscoelastic such as Orcolon to uh, maintain the chamber and leave room and tamponade vitreous. And then again, pulling decidedly in this direction this tear will extend and then whip around and can be completed onto the side of the opening, which would then leave an opening that looks like this. If this extent of the opening is also visualized, one may be fortunate enough to, to grasp one of these edges and complete it back as well to have a slit in the capsule, but the ends blunted to avoid extension during vitrectomy and placement of the intraocular lens. Here's a case with a large posterior capsule rent that occurred during phacomulsification. We're going to demonstrate blunting this end of this tear. So this end of the rent in the capsule would certainly extend out to the equator during any attempt to place an implant in the capsular bag. We'll now show how this can be blunted by extending the tear and turning it around to again join the side. then the end will resist any tear during placement of the lens within the capsular bag. The right side is grasped and with pulling directly toward the wound, the tear extends and whips around and again joins the, the side of the tear. So now that end of the tear is blunted and will resist any extension during placement of the lens within the bag after the vitrectomy is done. The upper border of this tear is under the rim of the anterior capsule and cannot be reached for this technique with current instrumentation. But when putting the lens within the capsular bag, the force is directed inferiorly in the area where we did not, where we did blunt the tear. Another application of the PCCC that you may want to consider is when faced with a dense plaque of the posterior capsule. Sometimes these plaques are so dense that one even would have difficulty removing these with the AG laser without a lot of energy and encompassing it and trying to move it out of position. I have on occasion with these dense plaques put the lens implant in, put adequate viscoelastic under the implant, and then started now out in the periphery a tear to encompass under the implant a continuous curvilinear capsulorexis of the posterior capsule. One may elect also to do that removal of the plaque and, if necessary, vitrectomy before implanting the lens within the capsular bag. But I usually put the lens in the capsular bag and then remove the plaque with 
a bent 30 gauge or bent 27 gauge needle slipped under the implant. Another application that I think will be used more in the future of posterior CCC is in infantile cataracts and very young children where the technique of posterior capsulotomy and vitrectomy is uh, considered the best technique to avoid the certain opacification of the posterior capsule. So in that very young child, one may remove, do an anterior CCC, aspirate the lens contents, and then do a small posterior CCC through which the vitrectomy can safely be done without extension. And then, depending on the age of the child, one may even consider implanting a lens within this capsule tire that is left with the central opening in the posterior capsule but with adequate support of a lens within the capsular bag. For those of you starting to learn to do continuous curvilinear capsulorexis, I would like to encourage you to believe that this is a skill that is achievable. And for those more experienced to strive for a successful continuous curvilinear capsulorexis rate of 99% or greater. This curvilinear tear in the capsule has allowed the development of the two-staged capsulorexis techniques, the posterior continuous curvilinear capsulorexis, and also allowed me to develop in 1986 the nuclear fracturing technique of divide and conquer nucleofractus, which requires an intact anterior capsule border to resist any tear during the stress of the fracturing during these techniques. So we have seen a complete circle of interdependence between the capsule opening techniques, the lens removal technique, particularly in situ fake emulsification, and the safe and secure placement of the intraocular lens within the capsular bag.